Hello everyone, you are about to listen to the teaching of Pastor Raymond Burnett, pastor of Mana Worship Center. We hope that you will learn from the message you are about to hear and to realize that books will inform, but the Bible has the power to transform you. Now sit back and open your mind and heart for God to speak to you. We are extremely grateful for the way in which you have been walking among us and in our midst today. Well, you've always consistently looked out for your children, and we are there just that. We appreciate you sending Jesus and allowing him to come to make it possible for us to reconnect with you in a way that you have ordained for us to become your children again. So we thank you. So right now, Father, I pray that that which you've allowed me to walk on and to understand, to clarify my own heart, and to make the necessary application will indeed be shared today with the rest of my brothers and sisters. So thank you. Thank you for being so awesome. And I submit myself to you now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Um, God is very amazing. Um, Sometimes you go through a scripture and at one point you thought you understood it. And then you have to remind yourself, don't ever take it out of context. Now that's a very important statement I just made. There are a lot of people and a lot of preachers and teachers, a lot of pastors too, who take a verse of scripture, read the scripture, without considering in one context it was um, spoken, then preach or teach, make the application, and we often wonder why it didn't work. Why? Because if it is not done in context, it is not effective. You misunderstand the truth. For example, we remember in Matthew they talk about um, where the twos and threes are gathered together in the midst there I am. Sometimes we pray that. And we always refer to that as just being a scripture that has to do if a church is small or if a church is big. It you know, has nothing to do with a church is small or big. Nothing to do with it. But sometimes we quote it to justify why we have a small group. But it wasn't that. We did read the context. And you discover it may have to do with forgiveness or forgiving in the sense of you doing differently. We'll talk about it later on, but what I'm trying to get you to understand is we quote a lot of scriptures. And we, but the Bible was written in a holistic view. If you take one out of the framework it is in, you're misunderstanding what he's saying. And when you try to apply it, you want to know why it doesn't work. God is consistently doing things in context. Going to the Bible to Genesis chapter 1, I, I, it keeps me running back and forth to this book. It's the book of beginning. I, I've never gone through a book so many times. The writer of the book of Genesis, we all know it's Moses, he, he quoted a, a statement that God said. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 and 27. And the writer of Genesis chapter 1 says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all, all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth Look at verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now, why am I, why am I reading that? If you were to sit down and read the book of Genesis again, I'm going to challenge you with this. And at the end of our time of sharing today, I'm going to give you an assignment and I even brought a gift to give you. For those of you who are going to be part of the project. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> well, I think it's wonderful. You should be saying praise the Lord. Because you don't know what the project is. You're thinking, I can't say amen to that yet. Because I don't think I, I'm not going to trust you that much to say amen before I know what it is. If you want to read through the book of Genesis. God is always doing something. And if you were to look in your Bible, and I highlight them in mine, and God said, I would have said, 
and God made or did or created. And God Are we back there? It's not working now. I took it off. It's okay. There was handheld, there was handheld mic before clip-on mics. <laughs> <laughs> and then there are times when there wasn't the mic. So if you went through the Bible, you'll discover, look at Genesis chapter 1. And turn this down a little bit, please. Genesis chapter 1. And in verse... Three, it said, and God said. That means God spoke. True? Verse 4 says, and God saw. Verse 5, and God called. He named it. And then in verse 6, it said, and God said again. Verse 7, God made. Verse 8, God called. He named it again. Verse 9, and God said. Verse 10, and he called and in the same verse he called the dry land earth he gathered together the waters called it sea and and God saw that it was good and God said verse 11 verse 14 God said what God is always saying creating doing and then verse 22 and God blessed them verse 24 God said 25 God made 26, God said, every time God says something, God follows up by doing something. God is not a person who just talk. He talks and he does. The question I've asked myself is, when I talk, do I follow up my talking with some action? Let me say that again. Because I think in some way, many of us are known for talking, but not for doing. It is easy to talk. It's the easiest thing to do is to talk. But when you talk, do you follow up in what you say by some action or by some other thing to confirm that what you say, you also believe in what you've just said? So when God said, let us make man, he didn't just had an eye there. He had the power to implement the eye there by actually doing it. So what God did, he said, let us make it. And then God said, let me follow through. Saints of God, as Christians, we should be known not only for saying. As Christians, we should be known for doing. I find that statement very powerful in my own mind. If I say I love you, there should be an action that followed my words that said, I believe you love me because you demonstrated it. There's a lot of talk these days. I'll see you tomorrow, but there's nobody showing up tomorrow. I'll be there for five, but five o'clock never came. Do you understand that? So there, there's, coming, there's a time now when words don't mean very much anymore. And therefore we don't have the confidence in believing that there will be a follow through. So then why do I trust the person who's not able and capable and willing to follow their words with actions? Jesus was the master at always demonstrating what he said. If you, if you want to listen to a good song that will help you out, it's called I Am Glad by a guy named Russ Taff. R-E-S-S-T-A-F-F. -S -S Russ Taff. It's called I Am Glad. I went to visit my father one day, about a year ago. I had never heard it. And um, somebody had done 
had copied, downloaded Rothstaff's CD, and they were playing it in the room. And I hit that repeat button many times. Every time I stopped, it went over. It went over. Then I Googled, I Googled him, and he was singing the song live on the gate of vocal band. And I thought, wow, last night I put it on, and I played it about four times, and he keeps saying, I am glad, I am glad. Well, I'm not going to tell you what he's glad about. I get you to listen to it for yourself. Then you probably fall in love with it as much as I did. The point I'm making is he was glad that God created him just like God. I thought, hmm. He said, I am just like him. And he was happy saying it. God said, let us make man. Well, fast forward. We all know what happened when, when man was made put in the garden. We all know that God and man lost connections. But I want to introduce to you a thought today that is extremely important. I said to you vaguely the other day, God's intention has always been to have heirs and joint heirs, children who he wants to share all that he has with. Everything he has. In other words, God is the owner of everything. God wants to share everything he owns with us. That's God's plan. God has always had a plan to have those he had created benefit and share all that he has. The gentleman who owns Amazon now is the richest man in the world. He's good for $126 billion. How would you like to have a father like that? I asked you the question a few weeks ago. I asked you the same question. But here's the point I'm making. The God we're talking about has a lot more. You can't even begin to figure out how much he has. And God's intent is he wants to bring us back into relationship with him so he can share with us all that he has and all that he is. It's not just getting the thing, but it's having the relationship. God values relationships. Any worthwhile relationship is worth building. Hmm. Any worthwhile relationship is worth building. And I'm going to share you a couple of things about the building. Any worthwhile relationship is worth. Let me put it this way. You know like we plant a seed. You got to grow it. It's worth our growing. So let me ask a question. What do we do to continue the building of the relationship with God? What do we do? What, what do we do to build relationship with one another? Communicate. Hmm, communicate. But you know God's always talking to us. And the most fantastic thing I'm realizing and I'm learning here is, I've been going through this, is that the Spirit of God is an agent I call him the agent. He's an agent. He's, he's always working with us, for us, but on behalf of God. So during the Old Testament, God the Father was always among the people. He was he's among them. His presence was among them. So the Shekinah glory. They took the tabernacle and they knock it down and they moved to another place. They built the tabernacle and, put it, and God comes down again. And as soon as they finish building it, the Shekinah glory will hang over the tabernacle saying, Guys, I'm here. When he wanted to have a conversation, he said to Moses, come out here, I'm out here. Moses will walk out to the tabernacle, go inside, and they'll have a little fellowship time. When, 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 when Aaron and his sister Miriam were upset with Moses because he had married an, an African person, and God, the Bible said, and God heard her said that. He heard them. Moses didn't even say anything. He never responded. Numbers chapter 11. Moses never responded. God talked on his behalf. And I said, then I said to myself, why would God hear the conversation that they were having about Moses? Why would God intercept this activity and didn't allow Moses to talk? Well, Moses didn't talk because he chose not to. And in the same text, the Bible said, and Moses was the meekest man 
on the earth in that day. In other words, he was humble. Moses did not accuse his brother and his sister of taking family matters outside publicly. But God heard. God defended him. God protected him. She became leprous. He declared she was, and everybody affected by that. I told you that before. But here's the point I'm making. When we are children of the Most High God, God steps in to play on our behalf. Oh, I wish you would get that. Because we are heirs and joint heir with Christ, there's some battles we don't need to fight. There's some things we don't need to talk. Hmm. Did you hear that? There's sometimes we just have to step aside and allow him to do what he wants to do with that. And the reason I'm saying that is we are his representative. He positions us in places. And when he does, he will take care of us in the place where he has positioned you. We don't have to fight. And I'm noticing in the Old Testament more than I've ever noticed before. Many times the children of Israel were always outnumbered but they kept on winning. Yes. When Pastor Brown was here, she told us about the 300 with Gideon, with the thousands that they had, and they never even lost one man. But here's the other part, they didn't even have to fight. Sometimes I think we take on fights that we ought not to be taking on. Sometimes I think we're ready for a fight and we're, there's no need for a battle. And God may say to us, if only you'll understand how I am working on your behalf, because I have you as an heir to everything that I have, and I want you to grow into the place where I can, en this is the best word, entrust it into you, because it is already, key word is, it is already your inheritance. It's not going to be, it's already that. Do you know that? It is already ours. We just don't know how to Tap into it is a good word. And most times I see we speak about these things, we think it's only material things. We think that's all we want. Well, you know, I believe that God, once we get into a place where we are understanding this, the material things now we show up after. We can't focus on that. It is not the motivation. God, I am your heir. Can you just sell one of the cattle on a thousand hills and help us, a brother? Because I think I need... I've negotiated that with him many, many years ago because I thought I was in a situation where I thought we needed some money. I said, God, is it possible you can sell a couple of those things on that hill and just release the funds? Because I thought that's why they're there. Well, they may not be only be there for me, but if others too. I said, how come other people keep getting this thing and I'm not getting it? Am I missing something here? But at the time I needed it, it came through. Oftentimes, we want it to prevent certain things, not at the time we need it. Did not the Bible say that God shall supply all of your need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus? And he has a unique way of doing that. He's promised it. He will keep the promise. When God speaks it, he follows up with action. Oh, yes. God is an amazing God. So, we are supposed to be joint heir with Jesus. We all know that. And I had read that scripture with you in Galatians chapter 4, verse 17, 4 to 7, and Romans chapter 8, verse 14 to 17. I had told you then that Galatians had to do with the Jewish people who had left their Old Testament practices and going back to those things. And God said, hey, you are joint heir with Jesus. That's why you're here. He spoke to the Romans in Rome and told them the same thing. I want to follow this. The Holy Spirit was the and still is the adopted, adopting agent and agency. Let me create a little analogy with you. Think of this way. Think of God the Father. Try and see if you can think about, think about a woman being pregnant. That she's married, she has a husband, they have a, she got pregnant. So somebody contributed, there's a pregnancy, there's a baby being born. And most times, when many of us were much, much younger, when we were born, many of us, it was a midwife that actually released us. And my mother said to me, you didn't get born in the hospital. We had a midwife that came home to the house. I said, really? She said, yes. She said, but we had to take you to the hospital because you were very sick. In fact, you would have died. I said, really? Many people were born, came in the world by 
midwifery program. That is becoming a very big thing again. Extremely big. In fact, it's so big that a lot of people are going into that. And a lot of people want to have their babies at home as opposed to going to the hospital and all the other stuff. Think of the Holy Spirit as the midwife. Follow me now. Analogy. Think about us being pregnant and Christ had the ability to carry us. And I'll tell you what the scripture is based on. The Bible said that we are in Christ. Isn't that what the Bible said? For you are in Christ. If I am in Christ, so I vision myself. I told you about more pictures. I see myself as being inside of Christ. And in order for me to be born of the Spirit, the Spirit came and said, it's time to release Raymond. He has to come forth. Locking him up inside of you would be no good to him. He needs to learn to walk. Follow me now. I'm a child of God. I'm in Christ. The midwife, Spirit of God, brought me forth and said, now, now that you're out here, you're free now to make the choice. Now that I've made the choice that I want Christ to come into my life, he now released me into the place of being adopted by the Father. Follow me now. Am I clear? Yes. Now that I am adopted, the Holy Spirit said, I, the agent, I am still with you. It doesn't matter where you go. I am I'm here. I have now been called, he's called the spirit of adoption. That's what we call him. But he has other names. He's called the spirit of Jesus. He's called the Holy Spirit. He's called the Spirit of God. So the Holy Spirit is extremely active because we are living in a dispensation of the church age where the Spirit of God is now living in people and is now actively putting people into the body of Christ. That's what he's doing. So when I became born again, I was placed into the body of Christ as a member or a part of that body. So are you. you now a member of the body of Christ. When you were born again, you were placed into the body of Christ. Now what part of the body he placed you, I don't have a clue. But I am a member. We are members in particular in the body of Christ. So if I am a finger, I was placed as a finger by the, by the, by the Spirit of God. And there are no important and less important parts in the body. Some of us don't like the big two or whatever. Some of us don't like certain parts. But he said, this is where I positioned you. But some of us want to be only the mouth. Some, it's only those parts that are very visible. This one lady said, I don't like the shape of my nose. I said, do you got it from your mother or your father? She said, I think it's my father's nose I got. I said, you can't do a thing about that. She said, when I get older, I am going to have plastic surgery. I am going to change the shape of my nose. I said, it will also change the shape of your face. She said, I don't like it. I said, you didn't give it to you. She said, I know. But I have got the power to change it. What is the point? Sometimes we are not happy with the place that we are in the body or what member of the body we are. But the Bible does say that every single member of the body is extremely special and was positioned by God. This is the reason why you're there. Have you ever learned to accept your body the way you have it, your own physical body? Do you, are you happy with your body? Well, you may think, well, Pastor, I think I don't like the shape of this and that, the shape of that and the shape of this. And I'm a little. Too, I remember years ago, uh, every time we go someplace, people always say, You're the shortest of all of them. I say, It's okay. I can't do anything about that. But I've grown to learn to accept what my height is. Do you know the hardest thing for people to do is to accept who they are and what they have? The minute I begin to accept things about me that are consistently who I am is the minute I became more self-confident. The minute I start finding fault with things about me is the minute I begin to feel insecure in who I am. 
And what I may dislike about myself is what I think others may dislike about me. Oh gosh. Yeah, I became very self-conscious. I told this many times about the smiling. I had this broad smile and when I was in school, they laugh at me and I stopped smiling. I covered my mother's high school actually until the teacher kind of brought it back out of me. And I've thanked him many times. This is about last year, him and I were talking about it again. I said, I need to remind you of something you did. I need to always thank you for that. Because I didn't think my smile was good because the young girls laughed at my smile. <laughs> I smile now anytime, maybe a chance I get. Because I've learned to accept that. Let me just say this to you. A Christian should be the most self-confident person on planet Earth. Because we know who we are in Christ. Now, so the Holy Spirit is the adoption, age, adopting agency who adopted me into the family so that I can become an heir and a joint heir with Jesus. We got that? Now, he's not only that. I told you another thing he is. But let me tell you something we talked about before. He's also involved, actively involved in the power part, the dunamis and the exousia thing I told you about. One is, he said, we have been baptized or we have been, we have received the power of God. You shall be endued with power from on high. So we have been given the right to use the name of Jesus. But we have also been given the ability to use the power of God in situations. We've been given the ability to do it. And we've been given the right to use the ability. Follow that again? So we've been given the ability to use the power. We've given the right to use the power. We've been given the ability to do it. So casting out demons, I have the ability to cast out demons because it has been given to me by the Spirit of God. I also have the authority to use the name of Jesus to cast the demon out. So I am not a fake. I'm not a false person. I am truly a child of God because I'm operating through the power and the Spirit of God every time I do that. So it is with you. Who gave us that right and the, the Holy Spirit has empowered us to do that. So I don't want you to think that he's only good for power. Hmm. But he's also an adoption agency. But he's good for other things too. One of the things I've also learned, in Galatians chapter 5, the Bible said that there are things that's called the fruits of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. Let's read them. I want you to see them in your book. Even though you know them, some of us, fruit of the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5. Paul had been writing to this church that was quite messed up with all kinds of strange teachings in the church. In verse 19, he said, Now the works of the flesh are manifest. And he gave us a list of them. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, stripe, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revilings and such in other parts said the list is so long I can't even find a book to write them of the which I tell you before as I have also told you in time past that they which do and that word is a continuous text tense verb do, do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God anyone who continually practice in those areas or any of them continually shall not inherit the kingdom of God did you get the point hello got it now, he gave us a list of the works of the flesh. But then he thought, I'm not going to stop on the negative. Let me give you some positive things. And then he said, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and such like. He ran out of names again. He ran out of names and names. There's no law. Follow this with me. I want to give you that. There's a capsule I'm giving you today. I'm not giving you the whole bottle. I'm just giving you a capsule. The Holy Spirit who adopted us into the family, who knows what the goal of the Father is for us to be heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus, who are inheritance, people who are in, have the inheritance of God. We have his inheritance. All the things that he has, everything about him, we are entitled to them. He wants to make sure that our character fits that. Get that? He wants to build our character. If you ever take time to study, not everybody gets everything one time. Let me explain that. 
If you've got five children, you don't give all the children the same responsibilities. You don't give all the children the same privileges. Because all the children can't handle all of it. So one child may get a certain thing and everybody thinks you have a favorite. But because this child is allowed X, and Y is not allowed, Y is saying, why is my brother allowed and I'm not allowed? Well, because your character does not fit yet for you to be trusted in this area. It's a character issue. I said to people many, many years, I've never, I don't ever remember getting a curfew. I was never given a curfew in all of my life. My parents never said to me, Raymond, you got to come in by 11 o'clock or 12 o'clock. I come in 1, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. Why? Because my involvement during that time was not connected to anything that was ungodly. Well, as far as they know. <laughs> no, but generally speaking, but it's true. Because everything that we did, I was a group of people, we went all over the place, so there's Youth for Christ and other stuff. My involvement was Christ-centered. Therefore, when I go someplace, they're not going to ask me what time you're coming home. But my other brother said, hey, you got to be in by this time. Not that he carried it out. The point I am making is you, 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 you allow people to share certain privileges based upon their character. God is the same. He will not entrust something to us if we are not capable of handling it. It will destroy us. Follow me now. Now, so the Holy Spirit is called, and the fruit of the Spirit are these. Love, joy, peace. And he gives us a list. Well, God is interested in his heirs and joint heirs to become children of character. And he said that character qualities I would like to build in you are Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, temperance. And if you do a word study on all of those, we can spend three months talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Let me give an example. Love. Simple example. Love. Agape. Unconditional experience of everything. Love. Well, love is explained by the same Bible. First Corinthians chapter 13 tells you what love is. So if you're going to do a Bible study about love, the fruit of spirit of love, you got to do First Corinthians 13. They got to connect. Yeah. For love suffers long. Every time I am long suffering, I am demonstrating that I have love. Kind. Every time I demonstrate kindness, it is one of the character quality of love. Love is piled up with all kinds of stuff. Every time, you're going to like this one. Love is kind, suffers long, envies not. Whoa, you mean if I love you, I will not be envious of you? It's true. Get it? If I love you, I will never be envious of you. Never. So when we demonstrate this envy activity going on, really, you don't really love the person. You're competing with the person. And you want what the person wants, but you want them to lose what they have so that you can feel better. That's not love. Envy is not. Vaunted, not as stuff. Not puffed up. There's nothing about pride in love. But love, then he said the positive thing. What does he say, Proverbs David, about love? He believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. In other words, I can't say that I love you now, and six months from now, I don't know what became of the love. I don't think I love you anymore. Some, something went wrong. I got out of love. What well, was it really love? The point I'm making is, for God so loved the world, it doesn't matter what we have ever done and what we will ever do, God will never stop loving us. There is no conditional thing that connects to love. So in the church world, why then do we treat people so conditionally and then we still say, I do love you with the hand around them. Man of Worship Center, we cannot demonstrate that kind of love. That's not the love we have. 
that's not the love God wants us to have. Amen. Amen. Love, love, love. So then he said, so the fruit of the spirit is connected to love and everything flow. Love, peace, joy. Joy, you mean, you mean, you mean to tell me a Christian should be a person who is joyful? Yes. Someone who rejoices? Yes. Then read Philippians to help you to understand that. Philippians is the happiest book in the Bible. It's a happy book. Rejoice in the Lord. He's also about rejoicing. Paul was in prison when he wrote about rejoicing. Wait, 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 wait. Paul was in prison when he writes Philippians about people rejoicing. He said, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, but you're in jail. Yes, I'm in jail, but I can still rejoice in jail. Wow. That's what a Christian is. That's who we are. That's our character. Amen. Amen. Love, peace, joy, and all your stuff. Then he said, hopes all things, believes all things, does all things. Here's what God wants me to tell you today. The Spirit of God is the one who owns the fruit, but he produces them in us. If you want to understand how the fruits are done, go to John 15. I'm giving you a little hint here now. John 15, Jesus said, I am the true vine, and my father is the husband man. Every branch in me that bear a fruit. There are three types of fruits, and there's some stuff he does with it. I'm going to give you a couple of things before I give you the next point and then stop. Listen to this. Christ is the vine, we are the branches. So think about a tree and think about the branches that come out from it. Think about the sap that flows up and down in that tree, the life that flows into that tree. Think about the Holy Spirit now. Holy Spirit. He's the one who produces the fruit, right? So now, this tree, think about a mango tree now. We all know mango tree. Good. The leaves are there. The tree is there, the branch are hanging out. Each branch ought to be able to bear fruit. Mangoes hanging out and all of them. No one getting you feeling that it's summertime coming and we're going to be buying mangoes. Trees, Canadian trees now. We're changing trees. In the winter time, when the trees lose their branches, the tip of the branches get very hard. The tip of the heart. Okay? Just like flower trees. Same thing happens to them. When the spring comes and they have to start growing leaves and other things again, there's a pressure that builds up in that tree. The sap wants to begin to flow again. But in order for the, it to bud, the tip of that tree that got really, really hard as a survival stuff during the winter time needs to be broken open. So there's a pressure that builds up. The minute that happens, the sap begins to flow. Then the buds begin to come out. And then the leaves begin to show up. And then the fruit starts showing up after that. Well, hold a second now. The leaves don't own the sap. The sap is what flows up through the tree. The fruit doesn't bear itself. The fruit doesn't bear itself. It is produced by the branch. The branch produces the fruit. Is that true? No. The branch only bears the fruit. It is produced by the sap. Let me try that again. The tree is here, has branches. The branch is incapable of bearing anything if there's no sap. If there's no juice flowing up through that trunk into the branches, that branch will have nothing on it this summer. It can't bear fruit by itself without being connected to the rest of the tree. We are not producers of the fruit. We are only bearers of the fruit. 
So the Spirit of God is the producer of the fruit. We are only the bearer of the fruit. We show the evidence that something is being produced through me and I wasn't the one responsible for making it happen. None of us can ever produce love. You cannot produce, you can pray, God, I need you to help me to produce. You can't produce anything. We can only bear it. Holy Spirit is the producer. Oh, I love him. He talk about peaceful. Holy Spirit has said, I'm going to walk out of these things in your life. You're going to become so peaceful, you'll be so happy. The peace of God that passes all knowledge and all understanding shall rule your heart and your mind. We did not produce it. We only bear it. He brings about situations in our lives to make sure that that happens. Do you understand that? We are not the producers. So don't brag. I was able to produce love. No, you weren't able to produce one bit of love. The Spirit of God did. I'm the most loving person. Come on, you're the most what? Loving person. You've met all the loving people already? So you've come to a conclusion that you've got more love than them. I've got so much love to give, nobody to give it to. A lot of people say that. How do you know that? That's why people have been running from you? That's the point I'm making. We boast about things that we don't have the ability of doing. We boast of things that we don't have on our own. We need to begin to focus on exactly where it comes from. So the love we have is not just ours, but it is also the love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts. Listen by whom? By the Holy Spirit. That's what he said. Is that what's in your Bible? My Bible said the same thing. So we talk about the Holy Spirit. He's the adopting agency. He's the one who empowers us. He produces fruit in us. Let me give you the last one. He has also, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he has gifts. The gifts of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The gifts of the Spirit. Well, what are the gifts of the Spirit? There are nine of them written in the Bible, but I guess there may be lots more than that too. Gifts of the Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He said, the gifts of the Spirit. Yeah, let's read it, because I want you to see it in your Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And these are not our gifts. They're gifts of the Spirit. We don't own them. They're gifts of the Spirit. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, they call, they call spirituals. Verse 4, now there are diversities of gifts. There are different gifts now. But the same spirit. There are differences in administrations, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of operations, but it is the same God that woke it in all. One second now. Did we just read about Spirit, Son, and Holy Spirit right? and God already? God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit there? Did you see it? Okay, let me read it again. Let me read it again. Look at this. Now there are varieties or diversities of gifts. But the same what? Okay. Next verse 5. There are differences of administrations, but it's the same Lord. Spirit involved, Lord involved. Jesus himself. Verse 6. And there are diversities of operations, but it's the same God, which woke it all in all. So all three persons of the Godhead are actively involved in the gifts of of the spirit are you getting that it's in your book praise god i'm glad you've got the book let's follow a little bit now he said but the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all every man gets or has the opportunity to have a gift many of the gifts operate in their lives and it's for some form of profit meaning benefit and then he goes through a list and then he said for to one is given not to all to one is given by whom by the spirit what the word of wisdom it's not wisdom it's called the word of wisdom to another the word of knowledge by the same spirit to another faith by the 
same spirit to another the gifts of healing by the same Paul want to make sure we remember who it's operating here to another the working of miracles to another prophecy to another discerning of spirits to another divers or different kinds of tongues to another interpretation of tongues and then he said but all these work that one and self same spirit dividing to every man severally as he will whose decision is it the spirit of god decides through whom in whom he works certain gifts of the spirit now the gifts of the spirit are very different from the official administrative gifts like in ephesians chapter 4 the the prophet the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. That's a different kind of operation from the gifts of the Spirit over here. These are, if you read Ephesians 4, these are the fivefold operational leadership ministries. Five of them. Over here, these are gifts of the Spirit. One person can be used in all of the gifts over here. It depends on what the needs are. So in one minute, Somebody may need a word of wisdom. And the Spirit of God, drop a word of willing inside of you, Sister Marva, and your sister, Sister Debbie. This is what the Lord is saying. Now, because of the need, somebody's going to benefit from that word of wisdom. So you give a word of wisdom. You don't have the right now to go on to everybody saying, I've just printed a business card. If you want a word of wisdom, I've come to me. I get this now. It's not your gift. It's the gift of the, you don't have ownership in them. We don't own them. So in other words, according to the need, use a word of wisdom. Give it to Sister Debbie. But three days later, you mean Sister um, Lorraine, and the Spirit of God says, okay, you start speaking in tongues. Nothing happens. You just start talking in tongues like that. And you're Lorraine, what's going on? And then he gives you the interpretation to tell her something. Because that's what she needed. She needed an interpretation of a tongue. He may just give you a word of knowledge. This is what the Spirit of God wants me to tell you. According to what the need is. See, that's what the church has to be operating. And every single one of us here, I guarantee you, there's something earmarked in you. You just have not believed that it's playing there. And you have not yet decided you want to flow in it. But this is wonderful. We are in a place right now, a church, where that is easy to start happening freely. Because we are open to that kind of sharing. See, Paul is writing to a group of people who live in, they were in house churches. They weren't in big gatherings, you know. They were meeting in homes. That's how church was. It wasn't a humongous cathedral. In fact, in most cathedrals, people don't even get ministered to. God has all kind of gifts operating there, but nobody's using their gifts. They just go to sit down to hear the man sit down and talk, and then they go home and that's it. There's no ministry to the body. Are you getting this yet? And it's not one person who is operating in the gifts. So this morning, prior to the service, we had a time of prayer around the altar. And for those of you who are able to make it, try and make it for next Sunday by, by 5 to 11. We'll have a time of prayer again. And, and Sister Charmaine was having something there, whatever. And I explained how it came to me. How do I know that somebody is having this? The Spirit of God, A, may allow me to have the pain in my body. I feel it and therefore I know it's not mine. So I said, somebody must have this. And I speak and pray against it and that's it. I, once, it once the pain leaves my body, I know you're good. If it lingers, I say, God, this is not good. Why is it lingering for this person? Is there a doubt going on here? Is it because the person is not willing to receive it? I don't. And then I said to him, in my mind, I don't want this. I am not taking this home. I am releasing it from me. And I do that all the time. I can't afford to take anything out of the church with me. I, no, that, there's no sale for that. I don't buy things. So You, you got me? No. So, so if, you, if you get the word, that feeling, and then another time, he may drop it into my mind and say, this is what's happening there. Whoever's doing it, just pray for the person, and it goes. The minute it goes from me, I'm good. And the occasional times when nothing happens, that people are not receptive and don't open themselves to it. And they may have it. There's so many times it's happened. At the end of the service, it's lingering, lingering, lingering. And somebody comes over to me, Pastor, do you want to pray? I say, what is it? 
The same thing you talk about. I said, you are causing me physical pain. I would say to them, I need to release that. And once I do that, it goes, what's the point? Sometimes people don't want to acknowledge that that which is happening with them, God wants to take it away from them. So they hold on to it and they carry it around for the rest of the day. I don't want it. No, I don't want I have enough for myself. That's the point I'm making. When, when, when you and I are in the body of Christ, we have people in the body of Christ that are being used by the Spirit of God to maintain healthy heirs of God. Let me put it that way. And joint heirs with Jesus. And the reason why we are joint heir is I feel what you feel and you feel what I feel. Are you getting this yet? Oh, I wish you would get that and say amen. When, when you know, like the weight that hangs on in you, like the weight that's hanging on in you. Why am I saying that? Just say there's a weight. I don't need to know what the weight is. It's not my business. But what is my responsibility? When he dropped that and said, "Father God, in the name of Jesus, that weight that has been, it's not hers." However that may have come, whatever the reason is. So I release that in the name of Jesus. Allow a situation, circumstance to begin to turn, turn that curve around in another direction. And let the freedom of God begin to flow in Jesus' name. When I do, I just pray on to what he puts in my head. What is my point to that? Do you think he extend, intend any one of us to be carrying the wrong weights? No. Do you think he wants to come along... Best word. He wants to come alongside of us. It's called a comforter. Come alongside of us. Put his arms around us and say, hey, you all right? Things are good. And then he said to you, I've got your back. Oh, yes, he got your back. He got your back. And when I believe that he has my back, what should my attitude be? I believe that and say, okay, I'm going to walk knowing that he's got my back. I don't have to, I have to look. What is behind my back? He's got my back. I may have the I may have the arm of God, but the Bible said that the glory of the Lord is my. But He's my rare God. He's behind me. I am never left without anything protected. It's not, I'm not exposed all the time. We are protected all the time. And then he puts people into your life who comes alongside of you and said, you are going to make it. The two or three shall agree as touching anything. It shall be done. That's, that's what the body of Christ is supposed to look like. Because we are joined here. Hallelujah with Jesus. And the older brother said, I want you guys to become just like I am. I've been obedient to my father, so be obedient to your father. That's what he's saying to us today. Just like I was obedient to my father. I sacrifice sometimes and it's painful, but I'm going to hang in there and then I come out on the other side. Just like I did that, you got to learn to do that too. Because you're joined air with, with me. That's all he's saying. Just like I was obedient to my father, I may have gone through a lot of painful experiences, but I've come out on the other side. For weeping may endure for the night, but in the morning, morning joy is coming to my life that's always trying to get us to understand not that you will not have weeping mm. not that you wouldn't cry not that you won't be discouraged or disappointed sometimes but at the end of the day you will become better than what you were when you first went in the night is coming but the daylight is shining bright for all of us that's all he's saying to us. Do not give up when you're going through that moment. Just like they were in the boat and they thought they were going to die. Jesus showed up walking on the water just in time. And says, stop messing around with my brothers. Come out of here. And they rode to the other side. That's what he's saying. Jesus is there as the older brother who's been through it all. And was very successful. He said, I've been there, done that. You are there now. I've been there, done that. When you meet somebody who's been through some experiences too, and they come alongside of you, you say to yourself, wow, there's hope, God, there's hope. Hope that make it not a shame. I am hopeful. I'm so thankful that he did it. He went through it. He overcame. And just like he did, we are also overcomers. It is the spirit that witnesses with our spirits telling us things are good. So the, the, things are good, Martha. As I almost said Deb again. Things are good. Things are good. Things are great. 
You know, he said to tell me, they tell you, great peace have they that love thy Lord. Nothing shall easily offend us. And the peace of God that passes all knowledge and all understanding is ruling your heart and your mind even this very moment. In other words, the peace of God in the midst of all of this is so amazing for you. You can go to sleep like a baby anytime now. When he said, let not your heart be troubled, do you believe in God? Believe also in me. He meant that. Don't become troubled. Don't become overwhelmed. Don't become overwhelmed. There are people that God has positioned and will continue to position in our lives to cause us to become more like Jesus with the fruit of the Spirit, with the gifts of the Spirit, with all the other things that he's there marked for us to experience will come to pass. My final comment to you is this. We are a part of the greatest kingdom that has ever ever been in existence the kingdom of God every kingdom that rose up all disappeared talk about the Assyrians they all no, no longer exist the Babylonians were powerful so they're not even existing like that well they came Medes and the Persians and they're all gone the Roman army came in and the Roman people were quite big and humongous Alexander the Great with the Greek people, they had their share. Russia had its share. America had a little bit of share. It was never a world leader, meaning they control the whole world. America controlled America, but infiltrated and over the place. What's my point? England, you would not have wanted to be a part, you would have wanted to be a part of England when England was this prime. It's not there anymore. Every nation has its period, but it fades out. The only kingdom that is eternal is that which we are a part of. Therefore, that's why we've got the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And that's why we have eternal life now abiding within us. Because we are eternal people. We're not temporary. We're not temporal. We are eternal we're just hanging out here for a little bit. But we're coming back. When we go up, we're coming back. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness. Of, the earth is ours. He's giving it back to us. So we're in this kingdom thing. And we got to get other people to join the kingdom that we are part of. Are you getting that? We're in something that's bigger than us. Amen. Very big. I'm glad you're in this part of it with me. And I'm glad I can share it with all of us. Bow and pray. Father, I guess I was very excited because I feel excited on the inside about what you have earmarked for us. Some days are tiring, some days are or this, some days are that, but this is just not chicken feet compared to the glory that you've got you planned for us. And as you bring us through this world and through this life, it is not just the bringing us out through this world for ourselves. You always have other people in mind for us to bring along with us. So we are going to be conscious of the fact that we are representatives of yours. You call us ambassadors. And as ambassadors, you take full responsibility for us. And you protect us wherever we go. We don't have a thing to worry about, but we worry anyway. We have nothing to be afraid of, but sometimes we are afraid. You just want us to begin to live in the midst of the storm that we experience to know that we are in a boat that is safe and we have someone who will come to our rescue if our life becomes in jeopardy. You've never left us and you've never abandoned us. So we are yours. So, thank you for my brothers and sisters here today. We're able to share a little bit more of what you're telling us about this power that we have. And we are glad that you share it with us today. Let the anointing of the Spirit of God that is so prevalent within everyone's life begin to manifest itself in areas where the manifestation has not taken root yet. But we are opening our inner man to the occupying of spaces that we have held away from the spirit man. 
we are turning over that area to him today. And we are asking that you'll occupy. We will learn to yield so that you can use us. I bless your people today. In areas of their life where there's a great need today. There will be an overflowing of something in every single person's life this week. Where we reflect and say, that was the spirit of God producing stuff and we're just bearing it. May we impact other people's lives this week and may we touch someone for your glory and for your praise. We do this now in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with your feet. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our message presentation by Pastor Raymond Burnett. If what you have heard has been helpful to you, please tune in again or write us and let us know how this message has ministered to you. Our email address is pastor at mwctoronto.org or call us at 647-340-9252. We would love to hear from you. If you would like to support this teaching ministry, you can send a donation to our mailing address, 170 Oakwood Avenue, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, M6E 2T9. If you are in Toronto or surrounding area, our meeting place is at St. Charles Catholic School. Address is 50 Claver Avenue, Toronto. Thank you for listening.